All right, guys, back with another video. Um, today I'm going to be going over, because um, I'm going to be doing the team-by-team -team breakdown or the division-by-division -division breakdown, probably starting over the next couple of days. But uh, being as there's a lot of free agents that are available right now, um, as a matter of fact, 18 of the top 50 uh, free agents that were ranked by... Um, a very good website to go to for information, MLBTradeRumors.com. Uh, they rank the top 50 free agents, and there are still 18 of them that are unsigned. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a, a short video, <clears throat> basically going through all of them. So that way, um, I do not have to go through them um, if and when they sign, because... When they sign, who they sign with, I mean, that could be any time over the next month to five weeks, depending, um, because spring training generally doesn't kick off until the end of the first week, beginning of the second week of February, so we still have some, a good amount of time left, so we're going to run through um, the level of time I spend on each one will vary. Obviously, starting at the top of the list is going to be Bryce Harper and Manny Machado. These are two of the top players in baseball. Um, I personally, from a fantasy standpoint, value Machado higher than Bryce Harper. Um, because of a couple different reasons. Um, there's not as much depth at shortstop. Your elite options are a lot fewer than there are on the outfield. Also, Manny Machado also plays third base. Um, so for fantasy, that's really, really important because if you're in a league where he has dual eligibility, that means you can play him at any number of positions. You can play him at short. You can play him at third. If you remember from my last video where I was showing you guys how you can do corner infielders and middle infielders, he may be eligible at both of those as well as utility. So that makes him immensely valuable. Because if you can get your hands on him um, early in a draft, the value that he provides is going to be really, really big. Also, depending on where he signs, um, most players carry their eligibility with them from the, from the previous year. So I do believe, um, and I could be corrected if I'm wrong, but I do believe he played enough games last year at both short and third, because when he was traded to the Dodgers, I believe he played a third quite a bit when Justin Turner was hurt. Um, he also played it short because Corey Seager was out. He played short primarily with the uh, Orioles, but I do believe he played some third there too. Um... So his value is a lot greater than Bryce Harper. Plus, when you look statistically, Machado is, he hits all the categories. So if you remember from my first video, and if you didn't, I, if you didn't watch my first video, I definitely recommend watching it, um, where I go over uh, the types of leagues, the scoring categories, and stuff like that. If you'll remember, um, there, there are generally five or six categories in offensive scoring for fantasy and that's home runs rbis average or on base percentage uh stolen bases total bases and runs scored those are generally the six so machado is good in all of the categories not so much stolen bases as he used to he doesn't steal that much but stolen bases <clears throat> much like saves for pitching, which um, I'm going to get into in another video about like advanced lineup creation, because a lot of people do what's called punting a category. Um, they don't worry about a certain category because they want to make sure that they're strong in all the other categories. So they don't worry so much about an even distribution of stats throughout their entire team. They try to load up on the key categories and they kind of let the other category they kind of let one category fend for its own and the two most common ones to punt are on the offensive side stolen bases and on the pitching side it would be saves 
So if you're going to have someone who is going to routinely hit you 35 home runs, who's going to drive in 90 to 110 RBIs, who's going to hit 280 to, you know, to 300, 310, is going to score 80, 90 runs, you know, all this kind of stuff, it's okay if he only steals 5 to 10 bases. Um, and I think Machado provides that a little bit better than Harper, who in the past couple of years has shown that his uh, average is not, you know, consistent. I mean, the last, in his MVP season, he hit 290, 300, I believe, maybe even a little bit over 300. But for the past couple of years, he's been around 230, 240. So that's that's quite a hit to take, even with someone who's going to hit, you know, 30 home runs. And if he's going to bat 230, he has to hit 30 to 35 home runs to be fantasy relevant. So Harper is, you know, he's on that cusp of, even though he's considered a superstar and even though he's going to get probably a really big contract this year in real baseball, real baseball is not fantasy baseball. Fantasy baseball is very cold. It's all about numbers, and it's only about numbers. This is good and bad because we don't care about intangibles. It does, you know, being a great leader doesn't make you a good fantasy player. Being a good clubhouse guy does not make you a good fantasy player. Producing, putting up numbers, getting hits, stealing bases, hitting home runs, That's what we care about. That's what, and it doesn't matter the situation. Like, say, for instance, a big knock on Alex Rodriguez, his whole career was he wasn't clutch. Um, He would, he was famous for hitting two home runs in a game, but his team would lose, you know, eight to three. And he would hit two solo home runs. So he was considered to be not a clutch player. Well, in fantasy, I don't care that his team lost 8-3. All I care about is he hit two home runs for my team, and my team gets those stats. So, And you'll see a lot of that when we go over to the football side in a few months and we start talking about fantasy football, where guys that you consider to be probably terrible players in actuality in the NFL are very fantasy relevant. I won a football league when you were Blake Bortles as my quarterback. Would Jacksonville's going to cut him. Jacksonville's going to trade him. Jacksonville benched him this year for Cody Kessler. Okay? And I want a fantasy league with him as my quarterback. So, fantasy, you need, if you're going to play fantasy leagues, if you're new to it, and, you know, if you're an advanced player, you know, you already know these things. But if you're a new player, you have to separate in your head what makes a good professional athlete doesn't always make a great fantasy player. It's about numbers. You need to be very cold and very hard and look at numbers. And, you know, if they're a good producer, it doesn't matter the time of the game. It doesn't matter the situation of the game. If they get a hit, they get a hit. You know, and that's what you want to see. So, you know, so there again, there are going to be players that I talk about that you're going to be like, he sucks, but he's fantasy relevant. You know, and for various reasons, and we'll get into those reasons the more when I start breaking down the teams and stuff like that. Just keep in mind that I'm going to say some players, and you're going to look at me like I have three heads, and you're going to be like, oh my god, I can't believe he's saying that I should have this guy on my team. But when you look at the numbers, I love looking at the type of thing where they're like comparing player A and player B. You are not seeing a name. You are not seeing anything. All you're looking at is the numbers. You're looking at their average, their on-base percentage, their home runs, their RBIs, their stolen bases. And you take a name out of it, completely out of it. There are guys that have been on my teams in the past years that I've won with that you'd be like, oh my God, I wouldn't want him on my team. Well, guess what? I wouldn't want him on the Mets, okay? But I'll take him on my fantasy team because he puts up the stats and he wins me money. So that's what you have to focus on. All right, so getting back into that, obviously Harper, you're going to want him on your team. If you're doing a redraft league, He's not a first-round pick. He's, based off his last couple years with average, I'm sorry. And some people might look at me and go, you're a Met fan and he was a national, so you're biased. 
I actually like Bryce Harper. I actually wanted the Mets to maybe take a look at signing him in this offseason. Not for the ridiculous amounts of money that originally were thrown out there. I didn't want him for 10 years, $400 million or anything like that. I, you know, But if the market came back to a reasonable amount where it was maybe 8 years, $250 million, 8 years, $200 million, something like that, then yeah. I'd take Bryce Harper on my team, absolutely, for that kind of money. I'm not paying him, you know, 40, 50 million a year. That's, you know, ludicrous. 25, 30 million a year, maybe. I would I would consider that. But fantasy wise, again, he's gotta show that he can put up the average again along with the power for him to be a top pick. And right now, I probably wouldn't draft him before the third round. I off the top of my head, I could probably name eight to ten outfielders that I would take before Bryce Harper. So, you know, so that's what that stands. Machado, he's a borderline first round pick. Um, if he's not a first round pick, he's definitely very early in the second round. Um, so you have to make that decision right away of whether you're going to spend a high pick on him. Um, because he probably won't be there when it comes back around to you. And if he is, People are doing some strange stuff in your draft, which could be good for you. Um, so, yeah, let's keep that in mind. So, the next one, and I have my notes right here, so if I'm looking down every once in a while, that's why. Uh, the next one is Dallas Keuchel. Uh, he's a starting pitcher. Uh, the past few years, he's been with the Houston Astros. Um, he's a good pitcher. He won the Cy Young. He is getting up there in age. He's 31 years old, which has started to get to be a little bit old for a starting pitcher, especially one who consistently throws over 200 innings a year like he does. Now, he is a lefty, and lefties do have a little bit longer of a shelf life typically than right-handed pitchers. Um, he's also not a flamethrower. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't throw 98, 99 miles an hour with his fastball. So, you know, he's not really that much of a risk for all of a sudden throwing his arm out and having to go out with Tommy John surgery. So he's durable. He eats innings. He gets quite a bit of quality starts. Um, and quality starts is, for those of you who don't know, um, it's when you pitch six innings and you give up less than three runs. And what that means is he's keeping the team in the game, which means he has a chance to accumulate wins. And wins is a big category in fantasy baseball. If you're doing category leagues, it's obviously going to be something you want to focus on. If it's a point scoring league, uh, wins is obviously going to probably have a decent point value for you for your team. So it's something you definitely want to look at. So when you're looking at um, stats for a pitcher, you definitely want to go to a website where if you're looking for stats where it shows their um, quality starts. Because the more quality starts they have, the better. There are some leagues that even use the dynasty leagues that I play and use quality starts as a category. So it's something that I focus on. So Dallas Keiko is generally someone I, I actually have him on one of my dynasty leagues. Um, one of my teams I do have him in. And he's a pretty key member of my team. Um, if you are looking at just a straight year-to-year -year fantasy league, I don't know if he's an elite option anymore. Um, I would think he's probably in the second, maybe the top of the third tier of starting pitchers that you're going to be looking at, because um, he, he's not a sale, Chris Sale from Boston, he's not a Jacob DeGrom from the Mets, um, he's not a Corey Kluber from the Indians, you know, Kershaw is probably still higher than him, even though Kershaw has had a lot of injury problems the past few years with his back and everything like that, so... He's taken a little bit of a dip, but I think that there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of starting pitchers you could probably look at before Keuchel. So for redraft leagues, again, you're probably looking third, third round, probably solidly, I would think, is a decent round to try and be targeting him because you're going to probably see a good 10 to 10, maybe 15 pitchers come off the board before you come around to Keuchel. Um, in keeper leagues, you definitely want, um, if you have them, you're going to keep them. If you can acquire them, depending on the cost, you're going to want it. You're going to want a guy like that on your team. In dynasty leagues, he's still definitely someone you want, uh, for at least another two or three years. And you might start looking at maybe flipping him, uh, to a team that's contending and they're, 
again, I'm, you know, for those of you who haven't played before, um, I might be getting a little bit of ahead of you. Um, I'm actually going to, that might be the next video I do, actually, is going to be uh, winning strategies. Things that you want to look at as far as, you know, how do you win a league um, consistently? You know, in redraft, it's just drafting the best players every year. In keeper leagues and dynasty leagues, which in my mind are a thousand times more fun, it's all about building a team. It is all about just building and knowing who's out there and looking for the next big thing before anyone else gets him. You know, taking chance on prospects, trading veterans before they hit the downslide of their career for prospects who are going to be hitting the upside of theirs. That's where it gets a lot of fun. And that's probably, I'll probably do that video, maybe on Thursday I'll do that video um, while I'm sitting here waiting for my daughter to get out of school again. <laughs> um, so I'll probably do that video. That'll be a good one. Now that's going to be, that'll be probably a little bit of a longer video. It'll probably be about an hour. So um, yeah, be prepared for that. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, to wrap up on Keuchel, dynasty leagues, you, you, you still want him. Keeper leagues, you're going to build around him a little bit. And in, in redraft leagues, he's going to be there, but he's not going to be, he's going to, he's a good starting pitcher. Like if you're picking maybe your second or third starting pitcher, he's a good one to target. If you're picking him as your first starting pitcher, you have, you're going to have starting pitching issues because there were a lot of guys you probably should have taken before him. So that's that's pretty much it on him. Now the next guy is Craig Kimbrell. Uh, he's a closer. He was with Boston uh, the past couple of years. Uh, he started his career with the Atlanta Braves. He was with the Padres for a little while. Um, he is basically one of the elite closers in the game. If you are not punting saves, if you are looking, and he gives you a lot more than saves because he strikes out a very high rate of batters. And I am sponsored by Wawa. Everyone should go to Wawa. Um, I'm not sponsored. Not yet, anyway. So, yeah. He is probably top top three or four closers in the league. Um, Araldis Chapman, Edwin Diaz, Kimbrell. Yeah. That'd be my top three, probably. It's probably one or two more that I'm not thinking of that if I... Uh, if I looked at some more notes or, you know, if I was at home and had my computer in front of me and could look at the actual rankings, guys, but just off the top of my head, I mean, it gets, it's pretty much those three. So you definitely want him in all formats. Um, I have, I have him in a couple of my dynasty leagues. I had him when he was a prospect before he came, even came up with the Braves. I waited on him um, and didn't give up on him and he has paid me off handsomely. Um, in some of those leagues. So he's definitely a guy you want. Now, we don't know where he's going to be yet. Um, the problem with relief pitchers is is that when they can be a closer for one team and then they hit free agency and they may not sign as a closer on another team. Jerry's Familia is um, a great example of that. He was a closer for the Mets last year. Then, because the Mets were horrible last year, they traded him at the deadline for prospects. They traded him to the Oakland A's where he was a closer there. Um, then what happens is he hits free agency. He actually re-signed with the Mets, but the Mets had already made their deal where they received Robinson Cano and Edwin Diaz. So now Familia is going to be the setup man. So if you're in a league that just rewards saves, he's going to have little to no value. Uh, because he may get a save here and there when Diaz, you know, if Diaz pitched two or three days in a row... Um, they'll let Familia close the game to give him a day off, which is great. That's great for the Mets. It's great for their depth. I'm excited about it as a Mets fan. But for fantasy purposes, I have Familia on a team that now I'm considering um, dropping him on because he's not going to get the save opportunities that he once had. He's a good closer. Again, not a lead, but he's, he's a good closer. So um, now the only difference on that is, is that a lot of leagues now, because... There's only, you know, 32 teams in baseball. So, or 30 teams in baseball. Yeah, 30. 30 in baseball. 32 in football. Yeah. Um, I always mix that up. So, because there's only 30 teams in baseball, there's only 30 closers. Okay? So, what a lot of, te a lot of leagues are going to is they're adding the holds category. And what the holds is, is that's a, it's a category that was created for 
setup guys and the seventh inning guy and stuff like that to where if you enter a game and your team is in the lead and you leave the game with your team still in the lead, you get credit for what is called a hold, meaning you held the lead for the closer. So a lot of leagues are going into um, rewarding that category. They're giving points for a hold or for a dynasty leagues and stuff like that. The saves category actually gives you credit for a hold in the saves category. So I played in a couple of leagues like that. So Familia then in those leagues still has tremendous value because he will get, um, he will get quite a few holds for the Mets. So it's great. So if you can then, if you can now stack, um, let's say you can get a hold of Familia and Edwin Diaz. Now, every time the Mets win, you more than likely will get a save and a hold because you'll have Familia who then hands off to Diaz to close the game. So that's going to be something that I talk about in that video about advanced winning techniques is going to be the, the mode of stacking uh, to where you want to try and get a couple of guys in a lineup or in a pitching staff together so that way you can um, you can capitalize on multiple stats. So, And I do that on quite a few of my leagues. I do it with line. I try and do it with lineups, with the high-powered lineups. So, yeah, so that's Craig Kimbrell. Uh, you want him in all formats. He's really, he's really simple. Uh, most of these guys, except for maybe a few of them toward the end, uh, you're going to probably want in all formats. They're, they are fantasy relevant. They wouldn't be among the top free agents if they weren't relevant. Uh, there's going to be a couple of middle reliever type guys that, depending on their opportunity, you may not want to draft in a redraft league, or if you do, you're going to be focusing on them later on for the um, for the ERA capabilities, for the whip capabilities, for the strikeouts. Um, but you're not going to be leaning on them for saves or wins or anything like that. So uh, that brings us to AJ Pollock, um, center fielder. Um, he was with um, the Arizona Diamondbacks. Um, very good. Um, he's a good hitter. He's got a lot of pop. Um, he hits quite a few home runs. The biggest issue with him is he gets hurt a lot. Um, I don't think he's played a full season in the past three or four years. He typically plays 110, 120 games. So he's missing a good 20 to 25% of the season. So that's going to bring his value down in fantasy because if he's not playing, he's not accumulating stats for you. If he's not accumulating stats for you, then, you know, it's very hard to, you know, want to commit a high draft pick to him. Um, especially, if you again, if you watch my first video, and if you didn't, again, I recommend that you do, especially if you haven't played fantasy before. Um... I definitely would say that you're not going to spend a high draft pick on A.J. Pollock because of the injuries, because you just don't know what he's going to give you. And now, this late in the offseason, when teams are forming their rosters and stuff like that, you don't even know what kind of opportunity he's going to have. He could be a platoon player, because people know he get, teams know he gets injured, so they're going to think that maybe the less games he plays, the healthier he'll be. So, you know, he's a right-handed bat, so they could sign him to be an outfielder and then platoon him with a left-handed bat to where he only plays against, you know, lefty, you know, left-handed pitching. He's going to he's only going to play maybe 80 or 90 games, maybe only get 3 400 at bats. And that to me is that you're not drafting a guy like that until the 10th 11th round. And again, that's where real life baseball and fantasy baseball are different because there are teams right now that would kill to have AJ Pollock on their team. You give me a guy who can hit 25 home runs in a platoon situation. And now I pair him with a guy who hits 10 to 15, you know, that's 40 home runs out of an outfield spot. That's great. I'll take that any day, you know, but for fantasy reasons, you want a guy, especially if you're in leagues where you set the lineup every week as opposed to daily. Now, in daily leagues, A.J. Pollock's great to have because on the days he's not in the lineup, you can put someone else in. But if you're in a weekly set lineup, if you put him in the lineup and he only plays one or two games that week, you're screwed. So in leagues like that where you're setting your lineup by the week, 
you want to make sure that the guys that you're putting in your, especially the guys that you're giving high draft picks to, that they're durable, that they're playing 150, 155 games a year. They're going to get you 600 at bats because they're just plug and play guys. You can just stick him in your lineup every week and you're good to go. You know, that's where your Mookie Betts, your Christian Yelich, your Mike Trout, you know, your Manny Machados, even your Bryce Harper, you know, he plays every game. Okay, so he's going to be a guy that you can plug into your lineup every week. Um, now, again, the daily setup leagues where you can go in, most leagues like that, you have until like 10 minutes before the game starts to replace somebody. So there are websites online where you can go and look at a lineup when it's released. I follow like on Twitter, I follow MLB lineups. And when the lineups are submitted, it releases the information for the lineup. I can check my lineups every day. And I can be like, okay, this guy's out, plug somebody in, you know, because you have your bench guys for that reason. So that's important to be able to follow stuff like that. So you want to, if you're going to get into fantasy on a serious basis, I recommend, like, I have Twitter. I don't use it for anything but following stuff with sports. I use it for lineups. I use it for, um, I use it for a lot of different things. I use it for injuries. I use it for trade rumors. I use it for all kinds of stuff. So that's really all I use it for. I follow maybe a couple other people on there, and that's about it. So, um, but I use Twitter 90, probably 95% for fantasy sports. Because there's a lot of great information out there. So, um, and maybe I'll do a video one day where I go on and I show you guys some stuff, like the pages that I follow and the websites that I go to and stuff like that for some of my information. Um, but, yeah, so coming back to finish up on Pollock, He's a guy that in redraft leagues, you are not going to uh, use a high draft pick on. I would say that based on where he signs and his opportunity for at-bats, now if he signs with an American League team and he's going to DH as well, that's huge because then he can get four, five, six hundred at-bats and now he's absolutely, he's worth a lot higher of a draft pick, I would say fourth, fifth round. Because if he gets that kind of at-bats, he's got the potential to hit 30 home runs, maybe drive in 90 to 100 RBIs, he's going to hit 270, 280, I mean, that's really, really fantasy relevant, that's a fantasy stud, you know, if you can, if you can get a line of 270 to 290 average with 30 home runs and 100 RBIs, I mean, that's a stud, um, now if he hits higher, if he hits more home runs, hits more RBIs, then you're talking, you know, now again, you're in that Trout, Mookie Betts, Christian Yelich zone, where, you know, that's great. Uh, that's exactly what you want. So if he signs with an American League team, he's going to be a lot more fantasy relevant. If anyone signs with an American League team, hitters-wise, uh, Bryce Harper, Manny Machado, any of these guys, then obviously the fantasy rel relevancy goes up because on their off day, they can DH. You know, if, if a manager decides, hey, we're going to give you a day off from the field, but I'm still going to hit you. Well, great. That's what I want. I don't care about his defensive metrics or his defensive stats. I just care about his offense. So, you know, so that's great for me. So that's where you want to look. When he does sign, you want to make sure that he signs with someone who's going to keep him fantasy relevant. So that'll wrap him up. Marwin Gonzalez is the next guy on the list. Now, this is a guy who's absolutely fantasy relevant because he plays everything. He plays three, if not four, of the infield positions, and he plays the outfield. He is what's called like a super utility player. He can, So he can play every game, but play a different position. But again, we don't care about what he's doing on defense. All I care about is his offense. And because he can play every day for various people, then that means when the second baseman needs a day off, Marwin wouldn't play second. When the third baseman needs a day off, he shifts over to third. If the center fielder needs a day off, he can get plugged in there. So... You know, the, he's the type of guy who's very fantasy relevant as far as opportunity goes. Now, as far as his actual numbers go, they're not as great as other people. So he's a guy who's worth a mid-round pick, like probably, again, that 8 to 10 round range. But more just because of the fact that he gets such great opportunity that he's going to put up numbers based on volume as opposed to quality. You know, where a guy like Pollock could probably put up as many home runs and RBIs as a Marwan Gonzalez playing a, a fraction of the games. 
So that's why they're both in that 8 to 10 round range. Uh, Pollock, just because he doesn't play as many games because of his injuries. Marwin, because he's that fantasy relevant, because he plays so many positions that he gets the opportunities to put a chunk of numbers up. Because again, here's this basic situation again of a guy that you might look at as, why are you talking about him? He's one of the top free agents. Why is he a top free agent? He's not a star. He's valuable because of his versatility. So that makes him fantasy relevant as well. So, again, a guy you're going to look at probably in a redraft league in the 8 to 10 round range. Keeper leagues, you're not going to use a keeper on this guy, but you want him, in, you want him on your roster. So when you, when you eventually do have your draft after you select your keepers, he's a guy you're going to want to have. Because, again, if it's a daily input league where you can change your lineup every day, you can plug him in in a lot of different positions. He's going to have eligibility at pretty much every position except for catcher and pitcher. So, you know, he's going to have his value. And in Dynasty Leagues, basically the same thing. He's pretty valuable because he does so much. So, moving on to now we're going to hit a guy. Um, we're going to hit two guys actually here where it's going to be opportunity-based. Um, and that's Adam Adovino. Um, who was a reliever last year uh, for the Rockies, I believe. Depending on where he signs. I mean, he's the type of guy that he could sign somewhere and be a closer. He could sign somewhere and be a 7th or 8th inning guy. So it really depends on your league settings. If all your league does is reward saves, then if he signs somewhere that has an established closer... You're not drafting him until the last couple of rounds when you're just looking to fill in your pitching staff with guys that can get you a decent amount of strikeouts or a good ERA or a good whip or, you know, something like that. You know, and that's in a redraft league. In a keeper league, in a dynasty league, those leagues are a little more serious. That's where you're going to see your holds a little bit more come into play. So he's going to be a little bit more valuable. He's going to, he's going to be a guy you're going to target a little earlier, probably in the mid to late rounds, 13, 14, 15, something like that. Now, obviously, if he signs somewhere that doesn't have a closer or if he signs with a bad team to where he could get a lot of save opportunities, you know, don't discount if you're in fantasy leagues, don't discount teams like the Marlins, don't discount teams like Baltimore where they're not getting a lot of wins because even a team that only wins 50 games a year their closer can have 50 saves. And at the end of the year, that's going to be one of the best relievers in baseball. So don't say, oh, they're a horrible team. I shouldn't take their closer. It means they may not have the opportunity for saves as much as a Craig Kimbrell if he's with, you know, if he goes back to Boston, let's say, or an Aroldis Chapman with the Yankees or an Edwin Diaz maybe with the Mets if they, you know, if they perform up to their expectations this year. You know, and teams like that, you know, the elite teams obviously – uh, Roberto Asuna with the with the Astros, you know, he's that's one going to be one of the top teams in baseball again. So he's going to have a greater opportunity for saves. But just because they're a bad team doesn't mean that their players aren't going to get their stats. So and that's something again where real baseball and fantasy baseball completely differ. You know, and you have to keep that in your head and balance out, you know, facts versus reality. You know, and we deal with facts. We deal with numbers. It's cold. It's hard. It's you know, it is what it is. It's not, wow, that team's the worst team in baseball. They only have 50 wins this year. I shouldn't have anyone on their team. I guarantee you there are going to be teams that win fantasy leagues this year who have a closer from the Miami Marlins, who have, you know, a hitter or two from the Baltimore Orioles and stuff like that. And it's the players who can recognize the fact that bad, good players on bad teams can give you just as good of stats as good players on good teams. And that's where your good, your dominant fantasy players come from. So, Adam Adovino, definitely opportunity-based. I wouldn't even, if you're doing a draft right now, I probably wouldn't waste a pick on him until, like, the end rounds, like in the 20s. You know, the late the late teens, early 20s for the, for the rounds. Um, you know, maybe even later than that, depending on how big your roster sizes are, how many rounds you guys actually draft. Um... Keeper leagues, you want them because, you know, especially the ones that reward holds. Um, Dynasty leagues, of course, most of those reward holds, so you're going to want to have him in that. 
uh, once he actually gets. And the good thing is, is if you're doing a draft right now and you pick him in, let's say, the 21st, 22nd round, and then he signs with the Marlins and he becomes their closer, well, that's bonus. You just stole a closer in the 22nd round. You know what I mean? So that's tremendous value at that point. So that's that's where if you're doing a draft right now, you take you you want to take a flyer on some of the guys I'm talking about right now because, you know, obviously the top free agents, Harper, Machado, they're going to go regardless of whether they're on a team or not because people know they're going to put up their numbers no matter what team they're on. It's going to be some of these relief guys that it's a good strategic dart throw where worst case scenario – he doesn't sign anywhere, and you, your league doesn't, re, you know, reward holds or anything like that. We well, can just drop him and pick someone up off the waiver wire. I mean, you know what I mean. So it's it's not a bad late round value dart throw to try and maybe say, ha, he signed with the Marlins. Bonus, I just stole a closer in the twenty first, twenty second round. So uh, the other guy is going to be Gio Gonzalez, um, left handed pitcher. He's thirty three years old. Uh, so getting up there a little bit, but again, remember your lefties, especially the ones that don't throw as hard and Gio's not a hard throwing lefty. Um, so he's a little bit more of a shelf life. He had a great run of success with, um, the nationals. Uh, he's a free agent. Um, again, it's going to be opportunity based. I probably, he's at the point in his career where he's not a frontline pitcher anymore. So if he signs maybe with like a Miami um, a Baltimore, you know, and those are kind of the worst teams in each league. So those are going to be my reference points when I talk about bad teams. If he's the best pitcher on their staff, he's not going to do as good. Um, his opportunities for wins are going to be less because he's going to be going against the top pitchers on other teams. And if he's the number one starter for the Marlins, he's not going to beat Jacob deGrom of the Mets on a regular basis. He's not going to beat Steven Strasburg or Max Scherzer of the Nationals on a regular basis. He's not going to beat Julio Tehran of, you know, the Atlanta Braves on a regular basis. And those are all teams in the division. So, again, a guy like that, I have no problem if you take a dart throw on him, if you're doing drafts now, in that 18, 19, 20th round to fill out the end of your rotation. Um... And if he signs with a good team, if he's a fourth starter on it, like if the Mets were to sign him right now, he would be the fifth starter behind DeGrom, Syndergaard, Wheeler, and Mats. He'd be the fourth or fifth starter on that team. I would I would be targeting him as a sleeper candidate to get 13 to 15 wins for the season. I'd be targeting him in like the 13th, 14th round. I would absolutely have no problem if you took him there. Okay, but... You know, again, if he signs with the Baltimore Orioles or the Miami Marlins or the Kansas City Royals or, you know, teams like that that are going to be, for all intents and purposes, horrible this year, you know, if he's their best pitcher, he's only going to maybe win 10 games, which does not make him very fantasy relevant. He's good if he's your fourth or fifth starter to complete your rotation, but he's not going to be. He's not a guy you're going to depend upon once or twice a week to go in and get you good numbers and get you a win. All right, so in redraft leagues, again, right now if you're taking him in the 18th to 20th round, I think that's a good spot for him. Um, if he signs with a good team, he probably gets bumped up a few rounds. If he signs with a bad team, he probably drops a few rounds from there. So uh, draft accordingly. In dynasty leagues, you're going to have him on your team. Um, he's a great pitcher to have in Dynasty Leagues because he's going to get you your stats. He's going to get you your numbers. Keeper Leagues, again, I'm not wasting a keeper spot on him by any means. But a guy who, if he's available, I will definitely um, want to have. All right. Uh, the next guy. Now, I'm biased here. I will admit this right off the bat. No, it's not a New York bet. Um, ha ha. Uh, for those of you who know me already from some of these videos, or if you know me personally and you're watching these videos, you know I'm a Mets fan, so you know I'm always going to pump up the Mets guys. But he's not a Met. But I like this guy a lot. I've always liked this guy. Um, he's a good player. He's a good producer of stats. And he just, he just flat out, he puts up his numbers every year 
Um, in the beginning of his career, he had some ups and downs. He had to get sent down to the minors a couple times. But since he's been up and has stayed up in the majors, he's been very, very consistent. That's Mike Moustakis. Um, he was with the Royals for a while. He was with the Brewers last year. And he's a free agent right now. He plays third base. And you can just pencil him in right now for a 260 to 270 average, 30 to 35 home runs, and anywhere from 70 to 100 RBIs, depending on where he signs and what kind of lineup he's in. So he's a guy that you want to be drafting. If you're in a redraft league, you want to have him in the first 10 rounds. He is definitely a guy that you want on your team. Um, Dynasty leagues, you absolutely want him. Keeper leagues... You're using a keeper on him unless you're just like third base rich and you have, you know, you have Nolan Arenado and Mike Musakis and you can only keep one of them. Well, then obviously you're keeping Nolan Arenado because he's a stud. Um, but other than that, you're you're keeping Mike Moustakis. I pray that he signs with a good. He's rumored to maybe be negotiating with the St. Louis Cardinals. And I hope he goes there because that lineup is pretty good already. It's a good, young, deep lineup. And if he goes there, he is going to put up monster numbers. And I have him on, like, two or three of my teams. So I'm really, really hoping he goes to a team like the Cardinals. So that's a pretty quick one. Again, you're drafting him in the first eight to ten rounds in redraft leagues. And if you have a keeper league or a dynasty league, he's absolutely a guy you're keeping or wanting to have on dynasty. Because he's still, he's still not even 30 years old yet. I think he's like 28 or 29 years old. So he's still in the, he's in the peak prime of his career. For baseball players, their peak prime years are anywhere from 27 to 31 typically. And then the downside starts to happen after 31. So when they're in that... 25, 26, 27 to 28, 29, 30, that's when you really want them. And then when they hit like 31, 32, that's when if you're in a dynasty league, you start looking to dump them off on someone who wants to like win now for draft picks, prospects, stuff like that. Okay. But again, that'll be the next video when I start talking about like advanced team building strategies and stuff like that. I'm going to really dive into uh, keepers and dynasty there. So, cause redraft is pretty much, it's simple. It's basic. You draft your team, you run your team, then you draft a new team the next year. So starting with the next video is really going to be where I get into more advanced keeper and dynasty league, um, tactics and thoughts and stuff like that. So, um, the next one is another reliever, uh, Cody Allen formerly of the Cleveland Indians. Um, he, a couple of years ago, was probably the best reliever in baseball. He was probably the best closer in baseball. But he's had some injuries the past couple of years, and he's looking to bounce back. So I think he would be a safe pick if you took him in a redraft league probably around rounds 10 to 12. Um, normally relievers start to go a little bit late outside of the truly elite ones. Again, your Aroldis Chapman's, Edwin Diaz's, Craig Kimbrell's, guys like that. Guys that are pretty automatic for the most part. Um, after that, people start focusing on other um, categories and positions. And then the relievers kind of wait. I think a Cody Allen... If he's healthy and if he has the right opportunity, he has the potential to be a top five closer in the league. So I definitely would um, take him around probably rounds 12 to 15. But again, because he's had the injuries, he may take a short term deal, like a one or two year deal on a team where he's a setup guy to show that he still has his stuff and then re-put himself back out on the market in a year or two so then he can go for a closing role again. So you want to pay really close attention to where he signs. So I really don't know or think if, um, you know, if he were to sign again, like let's say he signs with the Mets because his pitching coach in Cleveland was Mickey Calloway, who's now the Mets manager. So let's say he just wants to reunite with him and, you know, be like, hey, you know, I want you to fix me and get me back where I was. Well, now he might not even get a lot of hold opportunities because we already have Familia and we have Diaz. So he might be pitching the seventh inning a lot of days, which would be great for the Mets. I would flip out and, um, you know, it would be awesome to see that. Uh, personally as a fan 
but as someone who owns Cody Allen in a couple of my dynasty leagues, his value would take a huge hit. Um, and in redraft leagues, he'd almost be undraftable. So, again, a late round dart throw. That the same way with Adovino in that rounds 19, 20, 21, somewhere around there. And if you sign somewhere where he can be a closer, awesome, he got great value. If not, you didn't waste a high pick on him, so it's not that big of a deal. All right. Um, Bud Norris, Brad Brock are the next two guys on the list. I don't see either of these guys being a closer. Um, I see them getting a decent amount of hold opportunities and base, maybe a save opportunity here and there. So in redraft leagues, I would think you could pretty much ignore them unless you're looking to bump up stats like uh, strikeouts, ERA, whip. Uh, but there again, you're going to be picking those guys in the extreme late rounds. Um, in keeper leagues, you're not wasting keepers on these guys, but they do have value. And in Dynasty Leagues, you're going to want them because those rosters are so deep normally in Dynasty Leagues that you're rostering a lot of middle relief guys, and they're going to be good middle relief guys. So that's really a quick little spot on them. Uh, next would be Wade Miley. Uh, Wade Miley is a very interesting pitcher. He started off, I believe, in Baltimore, then went to Arizona. Um, or the reverse of that. I can't really think about it right now, but yeah. But he pitched for both Baltimore and Arizona. He's been he's a steady, decent pitcher. Um, much like some of the other guys I've talked about in this video, like a Gio Gonzalez, um, if he signs on a team where he's the fourth or fifth starter, then I think his upside is a lot better than if he signs on a team where he's going to be the first, second starter, even the third starter. I think if he signs on a a lot of those kind of teams, you know, he's his value is not going to be as high. So if he signs with the bigger teams like the Yankees, Boston, Houston, uh, the Dodgers, um, Atlanta Braves, you know, any of your playoff teams from the past couple of years, Cleveland, um, stuff like that, you know, then you're going to you're going to see a decent amount of value from him. So I would take him again in those middle anywhere from rounds 15 to 18. Um, in a keeper league, again, you're not going to use a keeper on him. There's a lot better pitchers and or hitters you can have. You don't have to waste a keeper on Wade Miley. Uh, Dynasty leagues, he's got a lot of value. Um, I think I think you're going to want a guy like that. So um, if, if you can get a hold of a guy like that, if he's on your waiver wire, I would definitely target him because he's going he's gonna to have value for you no matter what. Um, Adam Jones. Adam Jones is a really, really um, interesting uh, player. Uh, he was a center fielder for uh, the Baltimore Orioles for a really long time. He was a big hero for the United States in the World Baseball Classic the last time it was held. I think it was 2017. Um, he's a good player, but he's not a lead anymore. He's going to be the type of guy that's going to, you know, he's going to be steady. He's going to hit 260 to 280. 15 to 20 RBIs, anywhere from 60 to 80, uh, I'm sorry, 15 to 20 home runs, 60 to 80 RBIs, you know, he's not going to steal a whole heck of a lot of bases, but he, you know, he might get you five to 10 stolen bases. Um, his value still is in his defense and his range for, for a lot of parts. So he's going to get, he's going to get a decent uh, job um, with a team. I don't know if he's a full 150 game player anymore I really don't though so he's the type of guy that you're not wasting a top 10 round pick on him you know I don't even know if you're drafting him in the top 15 rounds but he's a great sleeper and he's a great value play anywhere from rounds like 15 to 17 um definitely a guy that you want to look at um if he's out there you could do a lot worse than having Adam Jones in, in a redraft league. In a keeper league, you're absolutely not using a keeper on Adam Jones. Um, but you want him on your team if he's available. So when you do your draft after you select your keepers, if he's out there and you can get him in the middle rounds of a draft, you're going to take him. He's he's a Because there is where your intangibles do come into play a little bit because he's such a good, heady player. He's going to get opportunity. Um, 
especially if he stays in the American League and he can DH a little bit again. That's going to be something that's good. If he goes National League, he might be a platoon player and he might only get 350, 400 at bats. So, again, that you know you're looking now you're looking in of rounds 18 to 20 in my mind. Dynasty leagues, if you have him, just start him. Especially if it's a daily league, you're going to be starting him most days. He's going to be a guy you're going to start. Uh, so, yeah. So that's that's pretty much it on him. Uh, Martin Maldonado uh, is a catcher. He's played with quite a few teams. Um, I do believe last year he played with Milwaukee for the most part. Maybe Texas. Um, I, think it was, I think he got traded at some point. He's mostly a defensive catcher. Um, I really don't see two unless you're in a two catcher league. A lot, a lot of leagues have two catchers. Um, if you're in a one catcher league, I don't even think he's rosterable. I think there's 24 better catchers. So if you're in a 12 team league, you're going to draft two catchers. One is your regular catcher. One is a backup. I really don't think you're drafting Martin Maldonado in a redraft league. Um, if it's a one catcher league, if it's a two catcher league, you're going to have him. Just because you want every catcher who's a, who is a starter to be on a team. Uh, so there will be enough catchers there to, to warrant that. So he'll be drafted in a two-catcher league. But if it's a one-catcher league, he's probably not even drafted in a redraft league. In a keeper league, maybe you'd have him. In a dynasty league, you're probably going to have him because most dynasty leagues are two-catcher leagues. So um, he'll definitely be on a roster somewhere, but he's not a guy that I'd like move heaven and earth to go get because um, his offensive stats are probably going to be next to nothing. Um, you could probably get a backup catcher who maybe only plays once or twice a week who might give you better stats overall because remember in a lot of leagues, it's cumulative stats at the end of the year. So if you have a guy who plays every day and hits 10 home runs in a year, and you could get a backup somewhere who hits 12 home runs in a year in limited time. You'd rather have the guy who hits 12 home runs. So you have to keep that in mind. Um, yeah, so I'm pretty sure he's pretty, He's only a top free agent because he's a great defensive catcher. He handles a pitching staff well. And there are teams out there who are looking for something like that. So, you know, he'll get signed, but probably shouldn't be on a fantasy team. Um, the next two pitchers... Um, I've had a lot of injury concerns over the past couple of years. Um, that's Irvin Santana and Drew Pomerantz, and I'm going to handle them both together because I look at guys like this as pretty much the same pitcher. Um, Pomerantz gets a little bit of a bump in value for me only because he's a lot younger. Um, I believe he's in his like mid to late 20s where Irvin Santana is in his mid 30s. So I would draft a Pomeranz before I drafted a Santana just because of his youth. Um, he has a greater opportunity to turn around. Santana's probably overall the better pitcher. Um, again, I'm going to fall back to the same argument of opportunity and where they sign. Um, again, to use the Mets example, if Irvin Santana signed to be the bit fifth starter on the Mets, I'd be very excited about his fantasy value. Um, but if he signed to be the number two starter on the Marlins, I probably would want him on the waiver wire. I probably wouldn't even draft him. Um, so, and pretty much the same thing with a Pomerantz. Um, these guys have been injured a lot the past couple of years. I'm not wasting any kind of high draft. I probably, I'm not even in a, in a redraft league. I'm probably not drafting them. And if I see them on the waiver wire and someone gets injured or if someone just absolutely is terrible for the first couple of weeks of the year and I want to drop them and pick someone up, I might give them a look at that point. But in a redraft league, I probably don't, I probably don't even look at them. I probably don't even consider them. I'd rather probably take a young prospect that was called up and throw a dart at them before I would take someone like the two of them who they're more than likely going to spend half the season on the DL again. In keeper leagues, you're absolutely not using a keeper on them. And again, depending on how many teams are in your league, they're probably going to go undrafted. In a 10 or 12 team league, they're probably going to go undrafted. Because you figure if you have five starters on a team and you're in a 12 team league, there's there are 60 starting pitchers that are better than them. So they're a bench candidate at best. Um, so... I really don't see them being drafted. In a dynasty league, they might have a little bit of value still 
just because of prior performance, maybe they turn something around. If you have DL spots, you can maybe stash them in there while they're, you know, while they're hurt and stuff like that. So they may have some kind of value there, but I'm not killing myself to either keep them on my roster. If I'm having to make drops to fit my draft picks and bench guys out of a draft and stuff like that, they're going to be too. I mean, I just dropped Irvin Santana in one of my leagues actually this morning to make room for people that I'm going to be drafting in a couple of weeks when my drafts start. So that pretty much tells you, and that was a dynasty league, so that pretty much tells you my feelings on, you know, an Irvin Santana or Drew Pomerantz. Um, yeah, so that wound up being a lot longer than I thought it was going to be. It's almost an hour. So, but that's pretty much the free agents. Um, I'm not going to get into the free agents. Those were the, all the guys that were in the top 50 free agents list. Um, any of the guys outside of that, if they're not in that list, because I'm already getting to guys that I'm like, yeah, these guys aren't fantasy relevant. I'm not even going to look at who else is out there because they're probably not going to be fantasy relevant. Um, so the next video I do, like I said, will probably be on Thursday, um, two days from today, where I'm going to really start diving into like some advanced, um, team building. I'm going to get into the concept of keeper leagues and dynasty leagues. I'll spend a couple of minutes on each explaining a little bit more about what they are, um, how to be successful in them, the level of commitment that it takes to play in those. So that way for you new players, Either if you're brand new to fantasy or you've only done redraft leagues and you're looking to maybe expand out into some of these kind of leagues, um, you'll understand a little bit more. I personally feel like I've said before in these videos that once you start playing dynasty leagues, I haven't played a redraft baseball league in 10 years. Um, the only way I would do that is if I started having the money to start playing some of the high stakes leagues that are out there. Um, to where it's like, you know, $100, $200 an entry and you can win like a grand, $1,500 if you come in first place. Um, I would consider doing some redirect leagues for that. Other than that, to me, Dynasty is the way to go. Dynasty is the most fun you can have playing fantasy sports, especially if you're a hardcore fan of the sport. Um, it has made me a better fan. It has made me um, a lot more active as far as um, knowing about the younger players and stuff like that, but I'll get into that a lot more in the next video. So, uh, for now, again, as always, um, like, uh, comment, subscribe, share, tell your friends about it. Um, have them take a look at the videos. If there's anything you guys want to see me cover, if there's anything I haven't covered that maybe if you have questions about things or, you know, if you just, if you didn't understand something, let me know and I can maybe go over it. Um, I can even, you know, I can have a conversation with you guys off of here. Um, I can, you know, get into a uh, messenger maybe type situation. And if you guys, um, want to know, you just drop me a line. You can drop me your Facebook, um, handle, or if you have like, um, discord or something like that and we can talk. Um, but yeah, just, um, like, share, subscribe, do the whole, do the whole thing for me. I appreciate it. And I'll talk to you guys in a couple days when we get into the next video. Have a good one.